I'm happy to see all of you here. I'm happy to see a lot of the regulars and, and some new people who have joined as well. And let's just get going. Let's bow our heads of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your blessings. We ask that you would be with our discourse today and that you would inspire us and speak to our hearts. As we study your scriptures, help reveal yourself to ourselves and help us to better understand and to better be prepared so that we can be ready when you come a second time is our prayer in Jesus' most holy name. Amen. Okay, well, again, good afternoon, everyone, and let's um, let's just go straight to the screen. Today, we want to continue our focus on Revelation, and we are in the second half of Revelation, if you will. Um, although not really, really there yet, but um, we are in a transition set of chapters, and we are covering chapter 13 today, and I'll talk a little bit about that as we go to the screen. So let's just go to the screen and allow that to sort of guide us for today. All right, so today we are looking at the three beasts of Revelation chapter 13, and we are in the part one, so obviously we're looking at the first beast, but I want to challenge you and suggest it may not necessarily just follow that. So part of your um, activity as we go through this lesson is to try to figure out who are the three beasts in Revelation chapter 13. You can do that in your own minds and in your own um, bit of scrap paper and stuff. Um, we will certainly cover all of that as we go through our activities in Revelation chapter 13. So this is likely to be a three-part session. We took three time, three parts to go through Revelation chapter 12. I suspect we'll do three to four with 13, and then we may simply do three to four with chapter um, 14. So we are going a little bit slow, but we are trying to simulate as we go forward. So we're looking at the three beasts of Revelation chapter 12, chapter 13. And I really should correct the slide because it says a review of Revelation chapter 12. We've gone past chapter 12 and we are now into chapter 13. All right. Our summary slide today is I want to just place chapter 13 within the overall book of Revelation chapter 12. So we will be doing that today, if you will. Um, I just bring up my pointer there so you can see the red dot. Um, and then we will take a brief review of what we did in Revelation chapter 12. That is extremely important because it gives a context of what we are doing in chapter 13. And then we go to chapter 13 itself. We'll talk about the first beast we encountered in chapter 13. And then we'll make some conclusions. And that will end today's session. All right. I'm hoping that we can be efficient. Um, but we'll see where we go. Um, thank you all again for being a part of this. Remember that you can use the Q&A, as some of you have done in the past, within if you are the, on the Zoom platform and you're using the Zoom to connect to the classes, you can use the Q&A, or you can put your hand up or use the chat, any one of those three methods. And once you do that, we will pick that up and we will um, get ready to provide whatever questions you have along the way. Um, and of course, if you have questions after the session of some of you have been doing, then you can feel free to return an email to me if you're receiving an email for this class. And if not, and you're on YouTube only, you can put your questions within YouTube and we'll soon get to the point. Again, later on, I intend to post, I know I promised to do it in February, but we are still a little bit behind in that. I will post a, um, a link, if you will, to the presentations. So you can go through them. I, you know the YouTube link to go back and go over the class itself. But we'll do the presentations as well um, via a YouTube link. So as we as we prepare to talk Revelation chapter 13, I want you to, um, I keep wanting to deconstruct your mind around the chapter divisions in the Bible. Even though we are using it to give us a guide and to help you know where to go and read and stuff. It's important to know that the vision that John received or the visions he received were not given in chapters. He, he got a vision. And this, this particular vision that we are reviewing really um, covers from Revelation chapter 12 to chapter 14. So you can see Revelation chapters 12, 13, and 14 as part of one vision. And what we studied in chapter 12 was a part of that vision. We are now moving into another part of the vision. And then when we get to chapter 14, we'll be concluding 
that vision. Is that okay? So we are using the, the vision um, and in different segments, yes, but they don't necessarily follow chapters. In other words, John didn't get a chapter 12 and then went to sleep and get back the next morning and got chapter 13. That was not how it worked. It was really, um, he, he got a vision and he wrote down what he saw in the entire vision. And then the biblical compilers would have um, out of necessity and under their own guidance, etc. And the, the guidance of God, we would think, they would have put the Bible divisions. I mean, we are following that as we go along because it's give, it gives us good reference points. Is that okay? So let's talk a little bit about... Um, the summary that we now have in front of us. So the first thing we want to just go back to is an outline of the book of Revelation. Quick review, of course, we know John is on the Isles of Patmos. It is a prison island. It is a desolated, jagged rock out in the Aegean Sea, if you will. The Romans have um, put him out there. Um, why is, is Patmos a part of um, a prison? Because the Romans, by John's time, which is around um, 80, um, 90 to 8100, which is when we are talking, 8100 is more around the Revelation um, writings, if you will. John, the, the Romans have already started to expand the empire beyond just uh, modern day Europe, if you will, and they have moved into the east, if you will, and they are more into Turkey and Constantinople and stuff have been established so that the Romans would have used the islands of Patmos, if you will, um, as, as prison islands. And that was not uncommon. John is, is maybe the last of the disciples, and he has been through a certain degree of persecution. But thank the Lord, he's still alive, he's old, and he's feeble. But God has visited him and given him these visions, right? So in terms of the structure, we know that um, Revelation chapter 1, verse 1, actually talks about the fact that we are given an insight into things which will shortly come to pass. So clearly the visions are, are projecting, if you will, things that will come to pass. And the question is, why do we do that? Well, we had answered that question a, a few sessions before, but I wanted to review that today, right? We had talked about the fact that <clears throat> if we understand that God is in control of the world and the events of the world, then we are less likely to become anxious and stressful. Because a lot of times stress comes from lacking control and not being too sure of what is taking place. And what, what the events of Revelation, and that's why we have labeled this entire series as God having a plan. Because we want to be, we want the assurance to know that God knows what he is doing. And even though we seem to be following um, disaggregated random events, there is no randomness about God. God is not caught by surprise when things happen. God is, there's a clearly articulated and evolved plan, um, articulated to the point where we understand, but to God, even the things that we do not understand or he didn't reveal, God has a very clear, distinct plan that he is doing so that we can understand he's in control. Um, it's also an assurance. You know, when Jesus left on the earth, he said, go into all the world and lo, I'm with you always until the end, Matthew 28. Remember that? So this is an assurance that God will be with us even during difficult times. It's also an opportunity for us to prepare for his coming because now that we know what is happening in the future, we can prepare. And then as we obey him, um, we learn to depend upon God because some of the, the events that are occurring in our world, um, they, 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 they come with such randomness. COVID-19 came out of nowhere, you would argue. Um, nobody really prepped for that even though some people were supposed to be prepping for pandemics on a whole, but nobody really fathom, if you will, the full-scale effect of this pandemic that we have seen in the last, I would say, 12 months. Um, so the, the fact is that what, what studying books like Revelation and the prophecies of Revelation and Daniel, what they do is that they give us an assurance that even when it doesn't make sense, God has a plan. And that he, we can depend upon him, which also deals with our sanity and doesn't expose us to too much of anxiety. Um, and then we remember his, his very um, poignant words in John chapter 14, verse 29, when he says, And now I have told you before it comes, 
so that when it comes to pass, you would believe it. All right. And we um, Christians living in the in the in the in the in the early um, 21st century, if you will, we have certainly seen a lot of history taking place, and we are therefore in a good position to say, well, these things have come to pass, and therefore we can believe in God. Remember, I won't go through the slide in detail, but just remember that the main theme of Revelation is Jesus Christ, and it is really about the second coming of Jesus Christ. I want you to remember that, because that becomes important as we go forward. There's a powerful quote from Ellen White where she says, in her book, The Acts of the Apostles, the figures and symbols, subjects of vast importance were presented to John, which, which he was to record that a people of God living in his age and in future ages, you and I, might have an intelligent understanding of the perils and conflicts before them. So even in John's time, it was meant to provide um, assurance. And in our time, God's word is meant to provide assurance. Now, when we discuss the outline of Revelation, I want to close off this summary section quickly, but I wanted to just emphasize where we are. We talked about the fact that the first half of Revelation, up to chapters 11, if you will, we're going over historical stuff. Of course, in John's day, it will be future events. But for us, looking back now from the 20th and the 21st century, it is representing events that had already taken place. So, so the seven churches, the seven seals, the seven trumpets, and indeed the seven churches extends, all of them to a large extent, extends into when Christ would come a second time. Right? The Laodicean church is a church just before Christ comes. This the sixth seal leads all the way up to when Christ comes and rocks and mountains are falling down upon people and they're crying and running, if you will. And then in the in the sixth trumpet, we also talk about a period of persecution just before Christ comes. And the seventh trumpet, the seventh seal, are really reflective of Christ coming through the clouds and bursting the clouds of glory. When we get to chapters 10, um, 12 to 14, um, what we're really covering is a transition section, if you will, that goes back to the great controversy that occurs between Christ and Satan and gives us context for why all this drama took place over those, those um, early years of the church, as well as the drama to come. All right, so, so, so this is a, a really important um, pivot chapter, if you will, because it joins the historically, the largely historical, because I don't want to say historical exclusively, but, but, but for the majority, it's an historical representation in the seven churches, seven seals, seven trumpets. And as we head towards more um, final events and, and things that will happen just about the time Christ is about to come, that is bridged, if you will, by a, a review of the great controversy, but it is more than just a review because it gives us a sense of how the battle between Christ and Satan is played out on earth's scene and how we are very well proxies, if you will, within a battle that is taking place between two, two heavenly and cosmic um, protagonists, which is Christ and Satan, all right? So we, so we get a sense of that, and that is where we are in terms of looking at Revelation chapter 12. Now, I also gave you a sense, if you will, that, that Revelation chapter 1 to, um, to 3.22, which is around the, the seven churches, the, 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 the references, the material, the metaphoric material that is used for the example, is really focusing on John's time. John was familiar with the churches in Asia Minor. As a matter of fact, he is, he is regarded as the pastor of the church of Ephesus and the other churches in Asia Minor. So this is familiar territory for John. And then Revelation chapters 4 to 11, if you will, gives us a sense beyond just using um, the, the images of John's time. It gives us a sense of what will take place in the early Christian era, if you will, the early centuries, from the first century until the time of the end. And then by the time we get to the eschatological section of the Bible, um, of Revelation, um, we are really talking more end-time events. There's an important 
point I want to remind you of here, which is that most of these um, visions began with what we call an introductory sanctuary scene. In other words, God seems to want to reassure you and I that he is up in heaven administering this earth. And that's an important thing to remember. God is not vikivai. So God isn't saying, well, I will do this and I will do that. He first reminds us that he's in charge. He has a plan. And then he reveals elements of his plan to us so that when it happens, we will not be perturbed. We will not be anxious. I keep repeating that because I want you to never feel anxious about closing events or feel fearful because God is in charge. So, so we have seen, for instance, um, God among the golden candlesticks before we got the messages to the seven churches. We have seen God up in his heavenly throne. We have seen a vision of three angels which will come to. We've seen a lot of visions, if you will. So I want to suggest that in this section here, um, between Revelation 12 to 14, we can argue, and I, I will want to, um, to, to posture that today, that and suggest to you that chapter 12 is an introductory scene. It tells us, it gives us a peek about what's going on in heaven and the war in heaven and the fact that God was victorious. And then it moves on into the main message itself, which will come in Revelation 13 and 14, which is where we will head off today. Everybody okay with that? So, so Revelation 13 is part of this vision that bridges the first section of Revelation with the second section of Revelation. The first section was heavily focused on the early Christian church and what it would do, but it also um, extended, if you will, the events and the activities until Christ comes. The second section of Revelation is going to focus heavily on events just before Christ comes. And the bridge between those two is this vision that starts in chapter 12 and concludes in chapter 14. We have already looked at chapter 12. We are now looking at chapter 13. I think that is as, as good a summary as it gets. Everybody okay with that? If you have any questions again feel free to raise your hands um q a or use the chat all right um so so let's go back to revelation chapter 12 and when we looked at revelation chapter 12 which we did for the past three weeks we established that there were three sections that sort of emerged one was satan's attempt to destroy christ while he was upon the earth and you remember the vision of the woman who was pregnant. She brought forth a man-child. And when she brought forth the man-child, the dragon attempted to, to um, devour. That was the word the scriptures used. Devour the man-child. And we said that that first section, the first six verses, if you will, of Revelation chapter 12, focus heavily on, on, the, on the devil's attempt to, to, um, to attack to destroy Christ when he came upon the earth the first time as a baby in a manger and then as a young man. Now, you and I know that that attack was unsuccessful because Jesus, well, you could argue, you know, some people would say the fact that Jesus died upon a cross um, suggests that he experienced a horrible death. It was a horrible death. And you could say, well, in that regard, he was not successful, but I disagree because he came to die for us. So he did what he wanted to do and what he intended to do. And then after that, he was resurrected and he went back up into heaven. So one could very well argue, if you will, that Lucifer did not succeed in attacking Christ while he was upon the earth. That's important. Eh? So if he, if he does not succeed with the child of the woman, they then it is very clear when we studied for the past three weeks that he then turned his attention to the woman herself. And we agreed then that the woman represented the church of God, both in Old Testament times and in New Testament times and down to our time. So the fact is that the, the, the devil, Lucifer, having failed to destroy and complete and fulfill the objectives of his attack of Christ while he is upon the earth, he now turns his attention to something that Christ values upon this earth, 
and that is his church. Now, when I say the church of Christ, I am not talking religion and denomination. I'm simply saying the church of Christ, the true believers of Christ who remain faithful to him. And when we get later on, we realize that if we are faithful believers of Christ, and if we understand what he has said in his word, then we live in a certain way and we follow um, the dictates of Christ and his, his writings in the Bible. And we, we adopt a lifestyle that is consistent with the expectations of Christ. And it is in that context we identify people by religions, etc. But the true fact of the matter is to be a member of the Church of Christ is not about having your name written on a membership record within a church. It is about having a relationship with Jesus Christ, first and foremost. That is the ultimate, right? So, so the second section of Revelation chapter 12 did a sort of um, contextual looking back. And it didn't just say, well, you know, the devil was out to capture Christ where he's upon the earth. It said why, and it carried us back into heaven. And we experienced the fact that the mystery of the universe is that sin occurred in heaven. That is a powerful mystery because we don't know how that happened. But the fact is, sin occurred into heaven, in heaven. And Lucifer... Um, convince one third of the angels of heaven to follow his word to the extent that later on in Revelation chapter 12, they are described as his angels. Meaning Satan had his angels who fought against Michael and his angels. And so we know that when Christ is referred to as Michael, it means that he is in the mode of commander, general, fighting on our behalf. So the, the Bible is giving us a um, a contextual narrative to suggest that Lucifer came from heaven. He was one of the, the, the creatures of heaven. Sin occurred within his being. He fought with Jesus Christ and the angels. He was cast out of heaven onto the earth. And he is roaming the earth because he has lost the eternal battle when Christ died upon the cross. And Christ said it was finished. It meant that they, they battered to paint God as selfish and, and, and a dictatorial, um, arrogant um, God who wants people to just pay him homage for vain glory or hubris. That failed because we saw the God of heaven sacrificing himself upon a cross of Calvary so that you and I might have eaten alive. So in that regard, the devil's judgment is now determined. He's found guilty. And what now needs to happen is his actual sentencing that must be executed. And that will be done when Christ comes a second time and he ends up into hell's fire. The question is, are you and I going to be part of which side of this equation? Are we going to be on the side of Christ and his victorious people? Or are we going to be on the side of the devil who ends up in hell's fire? That is something we will go back and deal with thereafter. So what, what we then did is that having understood the protagonist here between Christ and Satan, we then moved, if you will, to conclude chapter 12 by talking about the fact it gave us a little bit more detail over, the, over Lucifer's attempt to destroy God's church that remained upon the earth. And so we had the very powerful text that says he was wrought with a woman and went to make war with a remnant of a seed. But we were also told before that, that he attempted to destroy the church with a flood, meaning he, he really, um, he tried to destroy the church through false doctrines, through um, people who were coming in in droves, but they were not real followers because he had corrupted the doctrines, etc. during the Middle Ages period. And then we found that people um, preserved the pureness and the uniqueness of the gospel by going into the wilderness, going to America, when they crossed the Atlantic and went across to America, a place that was not populated. And the, 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 the actual verses in Revelation spoke to that by saying that the, the people survive by going into the wilderness and going to the land in order to get away from the water, right? So if, if Europe with its populous people is represented by sea, then America at that time with its, with its sparse population was represented as a land. And that is the way the prophetic interpretation went. 
All right. The, when we when we went through that, we saw that the main characters that emerged was the woman, which we talk about being the church, the dragon, and the child. The dragon, of course, being Lucifer. We are not left to um, to, to interpret that ourselves. The the actual text says the Lucifer, um, Satan is the dragon, that old devil Lucifer. Right. So so we know who that is. Um, we encountered Michael and his angels. And then we said the dragon also had his angels. And we said that they, they fought in heaven, but now the real theater of the battle is on earth. That is where the action is taking place, right? This is the this is the, the cauldron. This is the amphitheater. This is where the real um, gladiators are fighting between um, Christ and Satan. And when Christ is eventually victorious, the spectators, which are all the unfallen worlds, and all the, the hosts of heaven will recognize that God is indeed king. Christ is king, and he's the one who will rally for us, right? So we were also introduced, if you will, in the third section to a remnant, suggesting that um, towards the end of time, the, the, the remaining um, part of God's church, the last section of God's church, will be under attack. And we said that that, that remnant... Um, really represents the church of God, the members of God's church, after 1798, which is a period when um, the, 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 the French Revolution blossomed, if you will. And as a consequence of that, they brought an end to the domination of the Roman pontiff and the, Roman, the bishop of Rome and the Roman church in its, in its religious, political incarnation. That came to an end in the French Revolution, and particularly in 1798, when the, 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 um, the Pope, the last Pope at that point in time, was, was captured and put into jail and died um, under the direction of the general who was a general of Napoleon's I mean General Belfier. And that, that basically ushered in a period of, of, of no more domination by the Roman um, the Roman nation or the Roman church. That was the end of that. And so there was a, 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 um, an explosion of, of Reformation and Protestant beliefs after that. And then with the printing press, Christianity just boomed, if you will. And we are saying that those, those believers, people who remain true to God towards that then, are part of the remnant. But, but we, will, we will define it even closer because the verse says that the dragon has watered the woman and went to make war with a remnant of a seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. This whole reference to woman and seed um, harks back, if you will, to Genesis 3.15, where Christ in the Garden of Eden, after Adam and Eve had sinned, he had said to them that the seed of the woman will basically destroy the seed of the devil. So that is harping back, if you will, to that. So we saw two distinguishing marks. We said that the, the last day church of God, if you will, will will um will will obey God's commandments. So they will uphold all of God's commandments, including the fourth commandment. They will uphold all the commandments of God and they will have the testimony of Jesus. And later on in Revelation 19:10, we are told that the testimony of Jesus is a spirit of prophecy. So if you go back to this, it means that God's last day church would be a, a people who are keeping his commandments and who will be endowed with a prophetic gift so that they could be guided in how they live in these last days. And I told you that the granting of the prophetic gift to the church at different periods is a normal thing. So that, for instance, um, Noah was the prophet for the time of the flood. You couldn't expect Noah to be um, talking about Jesus Christ coming at the second time because he was not a prophet for then. We have studied Isaiah and Jeremiah who were what we call pre-exile prophets. They were the prophets who spoke to Israel before Nebuchadnezzar came and, and took them prisoner. And then you had Ezekiel and Ezra and Nehemiah, who were prophets for Israel after they returned to their nation, having been in captive and in exile in Babylon for 70 years. And then John the Baptist himself was referred to as Elias or Elijah, the prophet, because he was a prophet who prepared the way for Jesus, right? When he saw Jesus, he said, behold, I must decrease 
and he must increase. So the, the, the fact is God has um, constantly endowed his church with a prophetic gift and the prophetic gift has been very specific to the period. So, so you couldn't be preaching um, um, prepare the way for the Lord from as John the Baptist around the time that Noah is expecting a flood after 120 years of preaching. Because there are two different periods. So the prophets were unique to the period. And one of the things we discussed as well is that when we look at the way um, the Reformation movement evolved in the mid in the in the dark ages period in the mid centuries what we saw was that um through a number of these movers and shakers within the reformation movement whether it's the waldenses Huss, luther Lu, uh, martin luther himself john calvin or the anabaptists they came at different times if you will and emphasized different things but the advent movement that came out after the William Miller Great Disappointment Experience when they thought Christ would come on October 22nd, 1844. Out of that came another group called the Advent or the Adventists. And we distinguish ourselves then by calling ourselves Seventh-day Adventists because what we then did is that there was a huge focus as they went back into the Bible to find out what did they get wrong about 1844. They discovered the, the sanctuary service in heaven and the fact that that is really where Christ operates as our high priest, and all the texts that Paul gave about Christ being our high priest now made a lot of sense. But we discovered as well, and I'm saying we because I'm a part of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, we discovered the Seventh-day Sabbath and the importance of that. Uh, we discovered that there is no life after death until Christ comes. And we discovered the fact that our bodies are the living temple, and there was a heavy focus on the health message. And then I also reviewed, because this is all review. I also told you that in that period as well, we recognize that the church not only discovered these truths, but the church was um, enhanced, was endowed, was gifted, if you were a prophetic gift in the person of Ellen White, who wrote extensively on the Bible, but also wrote extensively on health, lifestyles, and how you should live, and, and Christian behavior, and managing our finances, and church administration, and then general prophetic interpretation, and she gave clarity around some of the stuff in the Bible. It is to her we credit this book, Great Controversy, that has given us such great insights into some of these same prophetic items that we are studying. So that the Advent movement um, not only uh, went back to um, observing the Sabbath, which is uh, one of the Ten Commandments, and therefore observing all the commandments of God, but it was also endowed, it was also enhanced, it was also enriched with a spirit of prophecy through Sister White. And as a result, one could very well conclude that certainly the Advent movement was, was basically aligned to these distinguishing marks of God's last day church, which is to suggest that they keep all the commandments, including the seven-day Sabbath, the fourth commandment, and they also had a spirit of prophecy among the believers. Any questions? Because now we are ready to plunge, having done that quick review and having picked up on what you have already been studying for the last three weeks. We are now ready to make the plunge into Revelation chapter 13. Everybody ready? Right, let's get going. So we now want to approach Revelation chapter 13. Maybe I spent some time on the image on the screen, right? So what, what we are encountering, of course, is out of the pages of that book, we are seeing reference to a seven-headed dragon well this is this by now is not new because we started off revelation chapter 12 where the seven-headed dragon was introduced and we were told then that a dragon is the devil so something we expect in this chapter we'll talk about the devil and his role and maybe what he's doing and then we encounter a, a animal i call it a beast a beast that is looking very fearsome it has um, seven heads as well. It seems to be looking like a leopard, but it is not a homogeneous leopard. There are, there are other distinguishing marks. There seems to be feet looking like bears. Um, part of the heads look like lions, etc. We'll talk about that. And then there seems to be another animal, another beast, if you will, that comes up. It has two prominent horns. Um, it, 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 it looks like a 
how a bison or something, but the fact that the eyes are on fire and if and the teeth are on fire is kind of dragon-like in its in its incarnation. So we want to see if these are the three beasts being referred to in Revelation chapter 13. And we'll want to see as we read whether you are seeing them in any way emerging. This is a powerful chapter. This is a chapter that is well used, but I argue sometimes is well abused within the Christian church. And people quote extensively from it without realizing some of the key points that are being presented. So what do you know? We also find three sections emerging in Revelation chapter 13. We had seen three sections when we had looked at Revelation chapter 12. And we were very happy about that because that gave us a good, um, a good place to anchor our thoughts and to kind of understand the different sections. Satan attack on Christ while he's upon the earth. Um, Lucifer and Christ, war in heaven, and the fact that he lost and he's thrown out. And then Satan, Lucifer's attack to the church of God while upon it because Christ escaped in the first section. What are the three sections that emerge in Revelation chapter 13? Well, in the first section, we encounter a beast who is coming from the sea. By the way, as you now read these chapters and these verses, you are as you are you are bona fide Bible students. You've been in this Bible class with me since April last year. So you know that water and sea represents people in prophecy. And they are, we had made a reference um, to, to, to text in Ezekiel um, that, that gave us that key to understand. And I'll come back to that next week and we put up those texts again. But the fact is, once you see a beast from the sea, a beast in Daniel used to represent a nation. Remember when Daniel saw a lion with wings coming out in, in Daniel chapter 7? We said that that represented Babylon, the head of gold. So, so once you see a beast from the sea, if I just said that alone by now, as very acute and very sensitive Bible students, you know that that seems to be referring to a nation on earth that comes from a very populous place. And we begin to ask ourselves, what is the message around this beast of the sea? So we will spend some time in verses 1 to 2, talking about its identity. And then we'll talk in verses 3 to 10 around some of its activities. And this is not a um, precision separation. There's some overlap. For instance, some of the identity things are, are, are also lodged in verses 3 to 10. Some of its activity things are also in verses 1 to 2. But by and large, we, we say that we will pick up identity of the beast and its activities. This pattern... This pattern of, of identifying a beast, looking for its identity and its activities, will continue. So in um, Revelation chapters, chapter 13, verses 11 to, to 13, we encounter a new beast. So we will say another nation, another kingdom upon this earth. But this one is coming from the earth. Again, without doing too much of semantics, if we have concluded from our previous study of Daniel, that where we are, you where sea um, and waters are referenced in prophetic writings, it refers to a place of people, multitudes, plenty people. Then it seems logical to conclude that when prophetic writings makes reference to land and to earth, it is speaking of a place where there is not a lot of people. So we begin to ask ourselves, what nation? emerges from a place where there was not a lot of people and I could kind of let go the, um, the secret now and say if you look at the, the, the um, icon to the left pretty well you realize that we are maybe talking about America so you need to stay with this lesson because maybe next week we'll be talking about America in biblical prophecy so you want to identify who this beast is and then we want to talk about the activities of that beast and then we will conclude the section by talking about an image of the beast. And the way that is written, we need to ask ourselves, which beast are we talking about? Is it one of these or is it both or if it's something else? Um, we'll see what that image is. We'll also try to identify the image and we'll talk about the activities associated with the image. Everybody okay with that? That is our outline of Revelation chapter 10. If you have read the chapter before and you're getting ready for the class, 
and, and the next few slides, we'll go through some of the verses ourselves. This is the kind of breakout we're talking about. We want to look at a beast that emerges out of the sea. We want to look at a beast that emerges out of the land. And then we conclude with a conversation around something called an image to the beast. And we want to understand what does that mean. It is in here. I can just tell you that up front because I know some of you are bursting in the seams to want to tell me about that. It is here that we encounter that powerful phrase, the mark of the beast. And we had some real, real um, powerful conversations last week um, in Trinidad anyway about the whether vaccine was the mark of the beast, etc. Um, and that is that is where this term finds its its foundation. So don't don't um don't jump to conclusions yet. Uh, we, as you know, we take a kind of progressive elaboration in this class. So we will try to understand the first section, the second section, and my spec my expectation is that if we understand the first section and the second section extremely well, you would find that the third section becomes relatively easy to understand because we are building on what we have learned in the other sections before, which has always been our approach to this lesson. Everybody okay so far? So we've talked about the outline of Revelation being in two parts, a historical part and an end time part, and we have, there's a bridge in the middle, so three sections. We've talked about Revelation chapter 12 also having three sections, Satan attacking Christ while he's on the earth, Satan attacking Christ while he's in heaven, Satan attacking the church while it's upon the earth, right? And then we have now come to Revelation chapter 13, where we're encountering a beast that comes out of the sea, a beast that comes out of the land, and we'll have a conversation about an image to the beast. But when we introduce the chapter, we also said the dragon has a game inside of here too. So we want to understand how that works. So the question then, as we approach the first section of our study, is who is this beast that is coming out, out of the sea? So look at what the verses said. Look at verses 1 and 2. It says, then I stood on the sand of the sea. And there's a big, um, there's some, some confusion over this very first line. Because some biblical, if, if you read the Revised Standard Version or some other um, other versions of the Bible that focuses um, very precisely on the on the Greek on the Greek and Hebrew writings, it it puts this first section here back with Revelation chapter twelve verse seventeen. It almost is to say, when to make war the remnant of the seed who keep the ten who keep the commandments and have the faith of Jesus. And then it goes on to say, and the dragon stood upon the sand of the sea. So the King James Version renders it as part of chapter 13, but some of the other um, translations renders it as belonging to chapter 12. Don't, 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 um, don't get tired and not over that. That is, that is a semantic that is based on the interpretation of the language and the lexicon and how that is managed by the experts. It doesn't change the overall message because all it means is that you could infer that this means John is standing on the sand of the sea and he sees a beast coming out of the water. Or it could mean that the dragon stands on the sand of the sea and he sees a beast coming out of the water. The bigger message here is what is coming out of the water. And standing on the sand of the sea simply means that you are at the edge of time. You're at a period where you are, are seeing the... The, 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 the waters of the sea um, trouble and something is happening. We assume that this is a period here after um, 1798, but I don't want you to hold that too, too precisely in your head because as we start to describe this beast, I suspect it is going to talk about a period before 1798. So let's, let's go to just review what the text says. So he says, again, I repeat from the beginning, then I stood on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea. The sea should trigger in your mind people, population, populous places. Europe is a populous place. The Middle East is a populous place. So that whole theater of the Old Testament Bible is a place of plenty people. Is it that John is having a message here? about a nation that arises out of, of that biblical era, we'll see what it says, right? Having seven heads and ten horns, 
keep that in your head. Seven heads and ten horns. Where have we heard that before? We come back to that verse. And it continues and said, And on his horns he had ten crowns, and on his head a blasphemous name. Where have we heard this kind of description before? We'll come back to that. It says, no. So he describes the beast. And we kind of get a representation here, if you will. We see seven heads. We see one head with ten, ten horns and crowns upon the horns, etc. Um, it says, now the beast which I saw, look what he says as he continues to describe. He said, the beast which I saw was like a leopard. His feet was like a bear and his mouth like a lion. Now, he didn't say it is a leopard. Eh? He said it looks like a leopard. So That's why they try to show these spots here. And then they show the bear, look here. And then the heads of these, um, the, the beast looks like a lion. So we begin to ask ourselves again, where have I heard this before? Let's keep that in our mind. The feet of a bear and the mouth like a lion. So he stops with his description up until this point. Then he tells us something. That's why I told you that there's some activity among the description. He says the dragon gave him his power his throne, and great authority. Who? The dragon gives the beast his throne, his power, and his authority. Who is the dragon? Well, our natural instinct is to say the dragon is the devil. Because we studied before in Daniel, in Re Revelation chapter 12, that the dragon is Lucifer, the Satan, the old serpent, right? And I told you that some of the days of the Leviathan, when in the in the in the Hebrew, in the in the in Canaan, the nations were there before the heathen nations. They had envisaged evil to lie below the earth in a multi-headed dragon. So that was a, a very good cultural folklore in the area around the heathen lands around Canaan. So when when Psalms invoke multi-headed dragon, and when when Ezekiel talks about multi-headed dragon and Isaiah. In particular, they are invoking evil in all his form. So when John uses the term, the dragon represents Lucifer, he is basically saying that that thing you envisage as representing evil, that is really Lucifer, that is Satan, the old serpent, the one who came from heaven. All right? So it is saying here that Satan gave him. That him here is a pronoun that can only be referring to what we're talking about so far. And what we're talking about is a beast. So he has personalized the beast in this vision and he is attaching to him the personal pronoun him. So he's saying the, the dragon gave him his power. That his is referring to the dragon's power and his throne and his authority. So the question is, where upon the earth with plenty of people did the devil have a throne, power, and authority? And you may argue with me, well, that one kind of hard to figure out. And I agree, it is hard to figure out. So we'll come back to it. Just I'm marking a spot because I want us to come back to that, right? So let's keep going. So, so we are talking about a beast from the sea and we have described it somewhat. And I told you that that description sounds familiar. So my fellow Bible students who have been with us since April 2020, you remembered that when we studied Daniel chapter 7, verses 2 and 3, it says, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven was stirring up the great sea. So we had looked at that when we looked at Daniel chapter 7, and we had then concluded that sea represents people, so that stirring up of the sea means from the wars and stuff that were going on in those nations in the Mesopotamian Valley, which we have been looking at and in the areas of the Tigris and the Euphrates River, and whether it was in the Europe or Turkey on the east, Europe on the west or Turkey on the east, that whole area, that whole Middle Eastern area, that whole, that whole center of gravity, if you will, for the earth and for the Bible was a place where people lived in droves, but around the Mediterranean basin, etc., all of that. But it was when they were at war that nations emerged, all right? So, so... So Assyria, of course, was a powerful nation, and then they died on, and Babylon became a powerful nation. And verse 2 to 3 continues by saying, And four great beasts came out of the sea, each different from the other. So in Daniel chapter 7, Daniel went to sleep, 
and he had a vision. I'm not so sure if John is asleep and having this vision, but he has a vision anyway. And we then said that he saw a lion with wings, and we said that that represented Babylon. That beast described as a lion with wings represented Babylon. Everybody okay with that? We then said that the lopsided beard that followed represented the media Persian Empire, and that the three ribs in its mouth represented the three nations of the um, of the edges of the Babylonian Empire who had to give way to Cyrus and his men to allow the Persians to become the dominant partner in the media Persian Empire. And then we said the Medes and the Persians, they ran for a while, the Persians certainly became a powerful nation for a long time. And then they were, they were attacked by the Greeks under the great general Alexander the Great. And who at 32 years, he died of a, a cold, um, if you will, or some influenza. And when he died at that young age, there was a lot of fighting and, and tugging, if you will, within his empire and his family to replace him. And he was replaced by four generals who ran the, the Greek empire, all right? So that, that was what the leopard with four heads was representing. Leopard because they rose quickly, wings because they rose quickly, but ferocious nonetheless as a leopard. And then we said they were re, re, uh, replaced by a fourth beast that had all kind of diverse descriptions. But we concluded then in Daniel chapter 7 that that represented Rome. Rome in two incarnations. Rome went through a metamorphosis. So it started off as what we call political Rome or civil Rome, and it morphed into religious political Rome, a place where the church had as much influence um, on the leadership of the kingdom as anybody else. As a matter of fact, it had influence more than anybody else. And the kingdom was more seen as a religious political kingdom than just any normal political kingdom. So we had distilled all that into a sequence of kingdoms that we said there was from the period of, of, of Daniel, eh? because this is from Daniel's dream. One of the things we talked about when we discussed the historicist method of interpretation is that we said that the prophecies that the prophet receives in vision generally tends to span from the time of the prophet to the end of time. So when Daniel got his, got his vision, he was living in Babylon. So the prophecy started with Babylon and moved towards the end of time. When John got his vision, John is living in the time of the Roman Empire. And you find that there's a whole lot of conversation and clarification and expansion and magnification of the Roman Empire in Revelation chapters, um, the early part of Revelation, than you would find in Daniel, because this is around John's time, and it also goes to the end of time. So we had said that the head of gold and the lion with wings represented Babylon. We had said that Medo Persia came after as the lopsided lion and also the silver in the metallic man image. And then we had said that Greek was represented by Greece was represented by the brass and the leopard with four heads. And then we said civil Rome, which is a Roman nation without a heavy influence of the church, um, which is pre-Constantine era, if you will. And Constantine came in around 313 AD, etc. You would find that that was civil Rome represented by the, the beast that defied description. But then later, post-Constantine, and by when I say post-Constantine, if Constantine era came to an end around 325, maybe 330 um, AD, you then found that the, the barbarian tribes were pushing hard, which are the tribes that surrounded the, the Mediterranean basin. They were pushing so hard that eventually by about 476, the Western Roman Empire, which is where modern day Europe is today, had crumbled and it was unidentifiable. But what what emerged out of the ruins was the Christian church. And it was led by a bishop, a pope, if you will, a pontiff, who had real religious power and religious reverence and respect. And so the Roman um, civil authority that was now heavily migrated towards the east, towards Turkey, Constantinople, what is modern-day Istanbul, um, that area, 
they conferred, especially through Justinian by 538 AD, they conferred upon the Church of Rome powers that were akin to a emperor and politician because they felt they could no longer have a nation emerging among the pagans, but they will, they will consolidate their political power with the Pope and with the leader of the church. And that worked because the, the pagans who had invaded, they started to pay homage because they were always very superstitious. And because there was um, the practice, we talked about syncretism, where the church now, under the, 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 the Pope and the Bishop of Rome, what, they, what, they, what the church leadership did was to assimilate aspects of the, of the invading nations, aspect of their beliefs, and, and, and basically bless it and incorporate it into the Christian beliefs, which was clearly against the Bible. So you had to have conversations now about praying for your dead, and you had conversations about paying for indulgences, and you had conversations about people dying and being your saints, and they could pray for you, and the mother of Jesus representing that. And you had all those beliefs that could be a transubstitution that said that if you prayed over the bread and the wine, in communion became the literal body and blood of Jesus Christ. All those things crept into the church during that period uh, because political um, Rome con conferred upon religious Rome not only religious power, which it had, but it also conferred upon civil power. And that era became, one would argue, a lot more dominant than civil Rome. Yes, civil Rome was known for its architecture, its roadways, its, its shipyards, its ability to move merchandise and, 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 and facilitate um, nations and cities, etc. But religious Rome, who had gained political power during the period of the Dark Ages, consolidated the power of Rome and protecting it against the invading crusaders from the, the Islamic world, etc., and from some of the Moorish rule. And then also strengthened the church during the period of the Reformation. So when Martin Luther and others were now hitting out against the church, they kind of closed ranks and, and they became even more stubborn and stamped out, excommunicated, um, sent people off from the, from the church, etc. And the church became a little bit more um, empowered, became stronger. And the nation of Rome found, um, if you will, new life through the church of Rome. So that period was clearly a very important period in its history. And then Daniel chapter 7 introduced the fact that, that um, after this period of dominance by the religious political room, which actually came to an end when secularism um, and republicanism found its way into the world discussion through the French Revolution and, and people like Napoleon and others. And then we had the 1798 captured the Pope. So what, we, what, what the prophecies of Daniel then did is that they pushed our minds to say that while things are on earth getting ready for Christ to come, God will begin his judgment in heaven, and then he will come and have his everlasting kingdom. All right, that is what we had studied. So we talked about, um, when we had talked about religious political room, being the little horn in Daniel. So these are the slides we used back in the Daniel days. We said that it will, that it will come out of the fourth beast, so it will be a part of Rome. It will appear after the ten horns, after 476, AD, when the, the, the barbarian tribes invaded Rome and destroyed Western Rome. It will start off small, the church started off small, but became powerful. And it will put down three kings, the Ostrogoths, the Vandals, and the Visigoths, I think. They were three churches, three, three barbarian tribes who were, who were basically run over by Justinian and his men. And when they ran over, he basically gave the area that they control over to the bishop of Rome, the, the, the pope at the time, and say, you control this area. And eventually, he progressively expanded his control to where he controlled everything in the West. And to the extent that the, the, the pope's influence on the eastern side of the Roman Empire became so strong, that by the time you got to 1798, the pope was literally controlling the Roman Empire. All right? But we know that that... That religious political um, version of Rome would have, would have said a lot of blasphemous things. So that during that period, the pontiff, the bishop of Rome, the pope, 
took on names such as suggest he's infallible. He's like a god upon the earth, etc. He had kings and stuff bowing before him, staying out in the cold. We gave all those stories already. We also talk about the fact that Christians who remained truthful to the Bible were persecuted during this period. And it is well documented by Gibbons and others, rise and fall of the Roman Empire and other historians. This period is documented as a period of dark ages, right? We also talk about the fact that it will seek to change times and laws. Well, we know that the church through Constantine would have established, Constantine established the Christian church, if you will, as his, um, his main religion of the Roman Empire. And in reward of that, he passed a number of laws to legislate Christianity. So he included in there a lot of things about how we pray, how we do mass, how we do purgatory. And some big ones he added in was that he eventually um, unified, if you will, the worship of the sun on Sunday by the, by the heathen nations with the worship of Christians on Sunday as well. And, and we talked about that before, right? We said that this was a progressive thing, but it became a real important thing because the, the, the early Christians, the, the Christians in that era wanted to distinguish themselves from the Jews to a large extent. And so they had already started to move towards observing the first day of the week as a day of worship and a Sabbath rather than the seventh day of the week as the Bible had said. So by, by making it law, by, by bringing it into effect, Constantine wanted to unify the Christian church and show that he was giving good support to the church. But in doing that, he, he basically opened a doorway for where his political and legislative agenda was now taking root. And the church um, basically used its political strength to change the times and laws. So while the Bible said the seven days is Sabbath, the church says you will come and worship God on the first day of the week rather than the seven day. And as a matter of fact, way back in those early days, laws were passed so that if you were um, in the rural communities or even in the cities and you worked on, on what was the day of rest on Sunday, you could be put to death. Some of those laws... Um, still exists on the books of some very advanced nations in Europe and in the West. Um, just that they are not enacted, but that doesn't mean that they don't exist. So that the, 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 the church um, would have seek to legislate obedience by saying you must follow this and that. And in so doing, um, Daniel described it as seeking to change time and laws. All right? And then he talked about the fact that it would be allotted power for a time two times and half a times. And we had worked out all the maths around that. And we had agreed that from 538 AD to 1790, it would cover the 1260 year period, um, which is representative of, of when that would happen. So it seems to us that we could conclude that this beast of the sea, to a large extent, if, if when Daniel had his vision, he began by seeing a vision of Babylon, when John has his vision, one can reasonably infer that his vision begins with Rome. But given the fact that Rome comes from um, the succession of kingdoms that started with Babylon, you see all the identifying marks of those previous kingdom in, in kingdom, sorry, incorporated into this beast that appears out of the sea. Now let's expand on that a little bit so it becomes a, a lot clearer. So a beast appears before John. It is a mix of the four beasts in Daniel 7. What are the four beasts in Daniel 7? In Daniel 7, we saw a lion, a bear, a leopard, and a beast with ten horns. Right? That was the sequence in which we saw it in Daniel. In Revelation, however, we are seeing the beast with ten horns. He then says he had parts of him that look like a leopard, a bear, and a lion. So John sees it almost in reverse. And therefore, I'm saying to you that Daniel lived in the period of the lion, which is Babylon. So he sees the lion first, and he moves all the way to Rome. In the case of John, he is living in the time of Rome. So what he sees is Rome, if you will, the fourth beast, and he is seeing it projected back looking at the, the way it, from the, the, the nations that came before it, its predecessor nations. Is that okay to everybody? 
So what, what we can conclude from this is that the beast coming out of the sea represents the Roman Empire because it is the same and it is consistent with the, with the clarifications that we saw in the study of Daniel. And remember in Daniel, we didn't have to guess because Daniel explained itself in the vision. In this case, there is no explanation, but we can make reasonable conclusions that the beast that John is seeing and the seven heads, ten horns, all of that is representative of the same fourth beast that, that Daniel saw in Daniel chapter 7. It is suggesting that what John is seeing is the Roman nation. Everybody okay with that? You all, I just want to go back and make sure you all okay with that. That the beast of the sea is the same one that is the Roman nation. Anybody alright with that? And that by by we know that the Roman nation had done a lot of persecution of the saints of God. So let's let's move on. There are some key things I want you to remember. I remember we talked about the dragon giving the beast his power, his authority. And his seat. Remember that? Think about that now. Now that we are clear, or at least clearer, that this beast out of the sea represents a room. What part of room is it representing? Is it representing? So let, let's go to that. Um, let's go back to that verse if we can. I know it's a lot, but I want to go back there. Uh, it's taking too long. Um, but we remember that the verse said the beast gave it its power, seat, and authority, right? So, so what I wanted to remember is that in 538 AD, maybe that's what I can just go back to. Sorry about the back and forth, please. In 538 AD, civil Rome gave to Christian Rome or religious Rome the same power as an emperor or king. So you begin to ask yourself, is the dragon the devil or is the dragon civil room? And I want you to keep that in your head because we'll come back and talk about that as we go forward now, right? So we have identified the beast coming out of the sea to represent Rome. And we begin to believe we are moving in the inclination that it must be the religious political part of Rome because it is, it is we talk about it activi its activities now and we see if it's doing the same thing religious political Rome did in Daniel's day. Now remember, before we go to the actual slide, remember in Daniel's day, religious political Rome persecuted the saints, where are the saints of the Mosai, sought to change time and laws, um, seem to be blasphemous. Blasphemous means it is flying in the face of God's authority. It seeks to put itself in place of God. And then it sort of changed times and laws. Remember that? Those were some of the key things. Let's talk about the, the beast and the sea now. And exactly. So verse 3 says, And I saw one of the heads as it were wounded to death. So the, 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 the beast receives a wound and because it's its head, it affects the whole beast. I don't feel it's just the head alone. So the whole beast looks like it's about to die. But he says, before he even before that, the, before the magnitude of that soaks in, he says, and his deadly wound was healed. So it's almost as if to say, you know, if, if I came to you and I said, you know, um, I got a cut and it, it was real deep, boy. And before you could get into the story about how deep, because I say, but don't worry, it heal up now. Everything okay. So John is kind of saying, this, 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 this beast, so he's giving us some more clues because we are trying to identify, we, we kind of narrow it down by now from the previous section. And we think that this beast identifies Rome. Where we are a little bit gray and fuzzy is that we are trying to figure out whether it, it represents civil incarnation of Rome or the religious political incarnation of Rome. That's, that's okay. But we're getting some clues here. It says, he saw one of his heads as it were, um, wounded to death, and his deadly one was healed. And then he says, all the world wandered after his, this beast. So that's in, in powerful. We had to figure that one out a bit. 
And then verse 4 says, and they worship the dragon which gave power unto the beast. So that thing comes back again, which we saw in, in verse 2. It comes back again in verse 4, it's saying, and they, meaning all the world, worship the dragon which gave power unto the beast. So, so we are seeing something here that is occurring. Yes, I want you to read this very, very carefully with me. It says, I saw that one of his heads, as it were, wounded to death. Now, this, this is an important sentence construction here, because what he's saying is that it is not dead, but it is almost to death. You know, you know, sometimes the old parents in the in the um, Caribbean, when we grew up in the communities, they would say, I'll beat you to within an inch of your life. That don't mean that they go and take a stick and measure to see if you reach an inch of your life. But the blicking is so bad, you feel as if you're almost to death, right? So, so were it not for the fact that they stopped beating you, you might have not died. And then, of course, today's world, if they try that, they get locked up for abuse and things. But that was the whole time of it. So, so in a way, John is saying that he sees the beast suffering a wound that is almost to death. It would have died, but he didn't die because the wound was later healed. Now, a wound doesn't heal overnight, right? That is not magic. This is the wound was going to take a while to heal. If he's using that imagery, you have to kind of follow through on the imagery. So the expectation is that after some time, that was implied in this language here, after some time, the wound is healed. And then he's saying, the world wandered after the beast. But then he comes back in verse 4 now, and he begins by saying, and they, meaning the world, <laughs> worship the dragons. If you just stop there, just stop there, and let that soak in. There's a little bit of sentence gymnastics going on here. Now, a lot of times the Jewish and the biblical literature uses what I noticed today the, the writers are calling parallelism. But in people like Malcolm, Mom, Mervyn Maxwell and others, where they call it a chasmic structure, right? Where basically you say one thing one way and you see it the next way, but it means the same thing, you know? Um, so, so in a way... Think about this here. The, 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 this, the first part of verse 4 seems to be complementing, seems to be expanding, seems to be in, 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 um, in support of magnifying what is said in the last part of verse 3. It's in front of you. So let's go over again after the colon. Basically, we are saying, and all the world, meaning the, the nations of the world, wondered after this beast. I wondered is the same as marvel. I wondered is as being in awe. So the whole world looks at this. You know, the whole world yesterday or day before, was it? Yeah, maybe day before. Yeah, day before was in wonder over Perseverance rover that landed on Mars. And once every news channel I turned on to, Al Jazeera, BBC, US channels, they all showed pictures of the, of the, um, of the lunar, of I nearly call it lunar, of the spaceship landing on Mars, and then the first pictures that Perseverance took of the um, of the of the crust of Mars and the land, etc. That was displayed almost on all the news channels. I see it on my internet feeds. It's on my um, old paper, newspapers, etc. The world marvel at that, right? So I'm saying to you that John is saying that the world marvel after the beast. This is still the beast from the sea. But then he comes in verse 4 and says, and they, meaning the world, people of the world, worship the dragon, which gave power unto the beast. So, and then he comes back now and he says, and they worship the beast, saying, who is like unto the beast? And who is able to make, able to make war unto him? So there is a sense, if you will, that with the, with the empowerment with the backing, with the with the with the infusing of his power of the dragon into the beast, that beast becomes real powerful, and he becomes synonymous with the dragon. I want to say that real carefully because I don't want you to lose sight of the fact that there are still two entities: a dragon and a beast. But the way this language is given to us. It seems as if John is, is intermingling, interpersing, substituting from time to time dragon and beast because in this context, he is suggesting 
that they will they are behaving as one and the same because we went back to the earlier verse in chapter in verse two where it says that a dragon gave the beast its power, its throne, and its authority. And then he comes back now and he says, a dragon which gave power to the beast, people worship the dragon. And one gets a sense then that they don't worship the dragon directly, but they worship the dragon vicariously, if I were to use that word, through the beast. Is that okay? Because the beast and the dragon are one. And I just want that to soak in your mind because... Uh, maybe in one of the, 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 the fourth sessions, as we conclude Revelation chapter 13, that, 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 um, that alignment between the dragon and the beast becomes extremely powerful. Now, the question we have to ask ourselves is how is Rome wounded to death? So you could say to me, well, there are two things. You could argue that Rome was wounded to death in 476 in the fifth century when the pagans arrived and they were so badly beaten that the, 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 the um, Roman emperor Justinian had to give the church political powers. And then you could also say to me, there's another event um, in 1798 when the Pope was captured by the French general Berthier of, of, of Napoleon's troop. A lot of commentators then because, of course, the printing press was now in full place of people could write. And that's just before 1800. A lot of people then said that this seems to be the end of the Roman church as we know it. So which is the event? Well, it seems that the one in 538 was not as, as dreadful as the one in 1798. Because in 1798, by the, now the Roman Empire was all consolidated into the Roman church who were running the whole empire. Um, but in, in 538, you still had a Roman nation existing in Constantinople, Turkey, etc. So it wasn't as bad, but the deadly wound therefore seems to be con to be talking about 1798. Look what the, I have a little um, icon to the left here, and it comes from the Encyclopedia America. Um, and it says in 1798, he, here made his entrance into Rome, abolished the papal government, and established a secular one. So it is clearly suggesting that that was really the end of one thing. Right, so I have a question. Let, let's take the question. So I want to go, the question is, let me just read this so everybody understands. It says, so you are saying that the dragon and the beast are used interchangeably. How so or why? And that is subjective interpretation. It is. So, so, so let, let's understand what, what we're saying here. So I want to go back to this verses again, right? It says, I saw one of his heads. Of course, he's talking about the beast here because verse 2 finished on the beast, right? And there's the beast with the multiple heads. This is the one that just came out of the sea. He saw as if he's wounded to death. I'm arguing that the wounded to death corresponds to 1798. Because the writing said that it almost as if the, the French Revolution abolished papal government. That was the end of papal government. And people thought that that was the end of, of the papal system altogether. All right? And the, his deadly wound was healed. So if, if 1798 corresponds to the end of the papal government, then the fact that we still have papal... Um, system of rule and government existing today means that the wound was healed, right? We still have a Pope, we still have a, a papal system of governance. The Vatican actually is considered to be a nation within Rome. Eh? You know that. So that the Pope is not just a head of a church. He's actually a head of state. If the Pope were to come to our country today, he's afforded, as he did in the 1980s. I was around then at, as a young student and I remember that. He comes with head of state status. He's given red carpet welcome and stuff, not because he's the head of a church, but because he's the head of a nation. So that clearly, um, if you said that the system was damaged in 1798, it is now clearly healed by this time and having prominence. Today, the church's, the church's voice is considered to be very, very important in the world today. So that, that's something we'll come back to. But to answer the question about the interchangeability between a dragon and a beast, let me just say that there is still 
two distinct entities, a dragon and a beast. But verse 2 of Revelation chapter 12, 13, sorry, told us that the dragon gave his power, his throne, and his authority to the beast. So we are, we are saying that that is one thing because he's given it its power, its throne, authority, which means that the beast stands in the place of the dragon. Anybody okay with that? And then we are saying here now that all the world wandered after the beast. So the beast or the, or the nation, let me use the proper terms, the nation, they're wandering after it. But then they also saying, and they worship the dragon, which gave power to the beast. So he is, he is implying, and I see the subjective part, accepting that fully, because that is what the interpretation is giving you to find the best solution for the interpretation. And we come back to the historical facts to line it up. So the dragon gave power to the beast. So, so they worship the dragon, but then he also says, and they worship the beast. So there is this constant interplay of a few things. One is the interplay between dragon and beast, which suggests that they are, in the eyes of the world, seen as one and the same. And we'll come back to that. And that is where the interchangeability is. And the other thing is that there is a system of worship that seems to be um, focused and centered around the beast that arose out of the sea and the dragon. So, so that's important because when he talks worship, he is clearly suggesting that who are they worshiping? They are worshiping the beast and the dragon. And, and they are suggesting that, that that vicarious link between the dragon and the beast means that when you worship the beast, effectively you're worshiping the dragon. That is the interchangeability. It doesn't mean that they are the same homogeneous entity. There are still two entities, but there is a a master-slave relationship, if you will. There seems to be one who is controlling the other, and that is what we kind of paying attention to. Right, so it says, so the, the question, the question asks another part, so it says, so the beast inherited the same characteristics of the beast, so it was basically a continuation of the same thing. Yes, I like that, and I, 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 I would easily, let me, let me say that again so everybody hears it. The, the person who was asking the question says, so the beast inherited the same characteristics of the beast. And when I first read that, I thought the person here meant the dragon, but she, the person is right. They're saying the beast. So it is basically a continuation of the same. In other words, when, when and maybe we just go back to that quick slide. When, when Justinian gave the, the, the church um, its power, it was saying to the, the church, you now will become political room. And in addition to that, you will also become religious room. So the church took on political and civil powers. That's why I don't like to call them pagan and papal, because I think that doesn't describe it. <laughs> All right, so, so I get corrected. They told me they really made the dragon, but I like the idea of the beast. Because you see, I want you to realize that the, the Roman church um, took on political power and civil power that became very, very phenomenal. But you're right. The fact is the beast now behaved and operated as a dragon. All right? Because if you talk about blasphemy, if you talk about um, persecuting people, etc., then what is happening is that the beast is 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 a um and there's a word that is not coming to my head and i keep saying vicarious but the, the beast is almost like a living incarnation a representation a proxy of the dragon so he is the truth and fact being what the dragon is saying and i like the questions because i want to say to you that we're not finished with this there's some more we need to explore that will close this up but you're heading in the right direction, all right? So, so that's great. Like a clone, ah, that's the word I'm looking for. So that's right, that's the word. So the, 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 the person just gave me that, right? So, so the beast is operating as a clone of the dragon. So the clone, you know, we are, we, we've seen cloning a clone in sheep, um, and I don't think we see cloning humans yet. Hopefully we won't. 
Um, but the clone looks like the original sheep. It has all the genetic structure, etc. But it's not the original, right? Um, so in a way, the, the 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 beast is operating as a clone of the dragon. And so in these few verses, if I were to just live on three and four alone, we'd have covered some powerful text going forward, right? Let's let's see if we can conclude. And they say, no, no, I wanted to deal with something else here. Look at the last part. It says, as the people worship the beast, which is a clone of the dragon, thanks again, made that word. So as the beast is, as the people worship the beast, which is a clone of the dragon, they begin to say, who is like the beast? Who is able to make war with him? No, that's a rhetorical question. And you remember that we had discussed that what does Michael mean? Michael means who is like God and who could be like God. And the answer is rhetorical because the answer is Jesus. Jesus is the son of God. Jesus, in some ways, can be seen as a clone of God. The devil is the dragon. It seems as if this beast is a clone of the dragon. And as much as Jesus, who is coming from God, is seen as who is God and who is so powerful, etc. The beast is duplicating that. I use that word deliberately and deceptively duplicating that. And in doing that, they are um, they, they represent, if you will, um, they are representing, if you will, the the fact that it's almost a mirror image of what is happening in the Godhead. So in the Godhead, you have God the Father, the Son. And who is like God? In this, in this, in this um, situation, you have a dragon, you have his clone, the beast, and people are saying, who is like this beast, right? So it seems as if the power that the beast gets from the dragon makes him worshipped and wondered, etc. And yes, all of this at this stage is metaphorical because it is it is representing something that occurred in real life. I mean, we want to come back to that, but I wanted to, to really establish that. So verses three and four are powerful verses that we want to stay to. And then verse five says, and there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies and power was given unto him to continue 40 and two months. So that is another clue because 40 and two months equals 1,260 days, which is equal to 1,000 metaphorically of 1,260 years. And therefore, it seems as if the beast out of the sea is clearly referring to the Roman Empire in its religious political incarnation that started in 538 and came to an end in 1798. So in the first section up to verse 2, we were kind of fuzzy. We knew it is Rome because we made the um, parallel correlation back to Daniel chapter 7. But we want to show which form of Rome it is. Now that we get to verse 5 and we hear 42 months, we tie that back to the religious political part of Rome. So when we talk about the beast receiving the power of the dragon, we have to think about that as well, right? Verse 6 says, and he opened up his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. I'll come back to this. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them and with overcome them. And power was given unto him over all kindreds, nations, tongues, and kindreds and tongues and nations. Right? So that is powerful. Now I want to drop a little bit of a um, nugget here, if you will, I would a caution to suggest that some of what is being discussed in these verses from verse 3 to verse 7. And when I come to eat as well, are not necessarily past. Some of this could be future. And that is really, really sobering and powerful. So I'm going slow because I don't want to confuse anybody. Verse 8 says, all who dwell upon the earth will worship him. And then it, it introduces something here. Whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world whose names, this worship thing becoming critical in these verses, because it's saying that all the earth will worship the beast, 
but the ones who are worshiping him, he then qualifies that by saying, but they are worshiping if their names are not written in the book of life. So it seems to suggest that there are two categories of people at some point in the earth. Those who worship the lamb of life, same on the foundation of the world, which is the next way to say Jesus. And those who worship a beast who is a clone of the dragon, which is the devil. So I just want to let that soak. Again, we'll come to clarify that. Then he says, if any man, so he almost finishes the conversation around the activities of the beast. And then he says, if any man have an heir, let him hear. He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. You know when the Bible uses that term, if any man had an heir, let him hear. What he's saying is, take note. I want to give you a, a warning, right? So he says, he that leadeth into captivity will go into captivity. He that killeth with his sword will be killed with his sword. That is a good little um, axiom to hold in life, but there's some very specific meaning. And then he concludes by saying, here is the patience and faith of the saints. So he's almost as if he's suggesting something else. So let's do some quick um, conclusions. So I'm saying to you that now that we clear that this is religious political room, we come back to this whole representation of the vision. And in this vision, it is focused on his activity during the 1260 years. So this beast is the religious political room and its role as a persecuting power, which is really driven by the papacy. Were you okay with that? Well, let's talk about the dragon because I realize I introduced that and I create some drama. So Revelation 12, 9 says the dragon is Satan. That was a very clear line. But we are very clear that Satan works through human agencies, right? In Revelation chapter 12, the dragon walking through Rome attempted to destroy Jesus. How do we know that? Well, remember we talked about the dragon um, at the belly of the woman waiting for her child to be delivered. So who does, who tries to kill Jesus? This is a real fire-breathing dragon? No, it was Rome. A Roman official tried to kill baby Jesus. A Roman governor condemned Jesus. And a Roman executioner crucified Jesus. And a Roman um, soldiers, a Roman governor sealed the tomb, and a Roman guard was over his tomb. So, so the point is that when we say the dragon in this context of Revelation chapter 13, the very first representation in 13 hour, when we said the dragon gave him his, his seat of power, throne, and authority, we are talking about civil Rome. Everybody okay with that? Because civil Rome literally did what that verse said. In 538 AD, Justinian literally gave religious political Rome its seat of power, authority, and its throne. You take charge of this area. Right? So in that context, the dragon is representing civil Rome. When we get the verses 3 and 4, where we spent a lot of time just now, I'm suggesting to you that that dragon could be the civil Rome who is, or political Rome who is given religious political Rome the power, or it could very well be alluding to the fact that the devil, Lucifer, is given power to the church because the church did some really dread things. And by the way, that is not a, a, um, a cruel thing to say because when we did the the seven seals. The fourth seal was a, a pale horse. It was like if there was nothing in it. The Bible is saying that even though the church exists, it wasn't really following God, right? So, so that is kind of where we are. So I want to keep that in your mind and we'll come back to that consciousness around the dragon. I want you to appreciate that the things we talked about, blaspheming and thing, we have seen that before. We saw it in Daniel. And there are some connections, if you will. So in Revelation, he says, and he was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. In Daniel, we are told that he shall seek to change time and laws, which is almost our kind of blasphemous kind of thing, right? And he was given authority to continue for 48 months, 42 months, sorry. Um, Daniel also talked about a time and times and half a time, which you know is the same 1260 years. So clearly they are talking about the same power. Um, then he opened his mouth to blaspheme against God. And Daniel said he shall speak with pompous words, etc. cetera. 
Ah, so I have a question. <laughs> question. The question is, which one am I leading to any dragon theory? In other words, who am I saying the dragon is? Is the dragon the devil or is the dragon um, political room? I'm saying they are both. Both of them represent the dragon. And we have to now examine the context to see what the text is saying. So that when you look at Revelation 13.2, the dragon referred to there is, um, is civil Rome. It is the nation of Rome giving its power to religious political Rome. But when you get to chap, when you get to verse three and four, which we spent a lot of time on just now, I'm saying the way that is written and saying the whole world worship him, etc. I'm beginning to think that that is talking about the devil himself as a dragon. And the question is, when does that occur? Which is what we have to figure out and we have to determine as we go forward. And that will be revealed as we go further into the chapter. So the, the point I, I want to conclude on here, I'm almost at end, is that there is a, a serious nexus, a serious connection, a serious alignment between the religious, the description of the little horn in Daniel chapter 7 and the religious of this beast in Revelation chapter 13. And therefore we can conclusively know be very clear that the religious political version of Rome is what we refer to in the little horn of Daniel chapter 7 and in the Revelation chapter 13. Everybody okay with that? And that is that is important. I, I'm making sure the screen stays up a little bit so that you can appreciate that if you go back on the YouTube, freeze it and just look at it and go back in the text themselves and see the similarity. So there are some identifying marks of this beast. It will revive the seat of its governance. It will receive, sorry, receive the seat of its governance from pagan Rome, right? Just civil Rome as we've been calling it. It will have a worldwide system of worship. The, the Roman Catholic Church is worldwide. Everybody knows that. Even today, from that period, it, it, it continues. It's a worldwide system of worship. You get that all over the place, right? It, will, it would speak blasphemy, just taking on Rules that says the, the head of the church is infallible. I am a king, I am myself, I can do no wrong. That is blasphemous. It will become a persecuting power. That happened in the Dark Ages period. It would reign for 12, 60 years. And then the other thing is that at some point, the deadly wound that received in 1798 will be healed. And then later on, when we get to the end of this chapter, we are introduced to a number 666. But I ain't ready to deal with that yet. I ain't jumping the gun. We'll get to that. But you okay? So some conclusions as we come to an end. Let me just go through them quickly. The first is, the beast represents an earthly kingdom as was represented by Daniel. Everybody okay with that? That was simply enough. Rising from the sea implies the kingdom that arose from a populous place somewhere in Europe. Fair enough. Compared to Daniel 7, this beast is the Roman nation. Yes? That is the fuzzy part of it, right? The dragon giving the beast its power, its seat, and its authority refers to religious political Rome from 538 AD. Everybody okay with that? That is a, that is a powerful conclusion we are arriving at because we are now saying that that dragon, which is civil Rome, to answer our question a while ago, civil Rome in that context, gave its power to religious political rule. The reference to a 42 month period is the same as the 1260-year period, which went from, 70, from 520, 538 AD to 1798 AD. And in 1798 AD, the church, the nation, experienced a deadly wound when the French Revolution and its rise of secularism and enlightenment, etc., brought an end to papal government, and everybody thought that was the end of the church. But it, it, I nearly say thank God, but the church continued, right? All right. The head of the beast being wounded occurs after. Go back and look at that verse in chapter 13, verse 2, or verse 1, I think it is. The head of the beast being wounded occurs after the dragon gives power, seat, and authority. That is after 538 AD, and therefore refers to the 1798 events when the French brought what seems to be an end to the Roman church. Were you okay with that? The wound will be healed 
means that sometime after 1798, but before Christ comes, the Roman church will be strong again. Nobody can argue with me right now that the Roman church, the Roman Catholic church is not a strong church. It is. The Pope has world eminence and power, right? So clearly, the attempts to destroy the church in 1798 did not succeed, and it is now that the church has succeeded again. Keep that in mind. The reference to the whole world marveling after the beast, and that shouldn't be beast, sorry, it should be beast, implies that the beast will regain a prominent position and a standing in world affairs. So that's what I say. When we talk about the whole world marveling, I'm not talking about necessarily the Dark Ages period, but this very well may be something that will come up in the future. Two classes of worshipers emerge. We talked about that. Those who worship God and Christ, since their names are written in the book of life of the Lamb, and then those who worship the beast who continues to be our agent, I will change that next week to clone, as I love that word, clone of the dragon, right? Everybody okay with that? And my last conclusion, do so, don't like so. <laughs> That's our word we use in Trinidad, meaning people don't like what you're doing to others, somebody will come and do to you one day. And so the concluding verses of, of Revelation chapter 13, chapter 13, verses 9 and 10, where he talks about those who um, captive, those who bring captive, going to captivity will be captive, etc. And those who kill will be killed with the sword. Is a warning that those who persecute and kill will themselves be killed. And that's exactly what happened to the Roman political church. They persecuted people, and then exactly that happened. God came through the French Revolution in 1798, and the exact head of the church that persecuted people and held him captive, was him, himself held captive and died in jail. The historian, historians tell us that they die, he died in jail, right, in 1799. The living saints are encouraged to be patient. That last part of, of verse 10, it says, here are the patience and the, faint, and the fate of the saints. That is almost an encouragement. It is saying to be patient. And I'm asking you why in this conclusion, and I'm saying to you is because God has a plan. Those are our conclusions. I will go over them next week again before we move into the other section. Next week, we look at the land beasts. So I've, I've looked at the fact that Revelation 13 has given us a real rich conversation today. Uh, we've used the Bible a lot to transmit and direct our thoughts. We had some very good questions around the interplay and the interchangeability of the dragon and the fact that the dragon may have a diverse view. I ask you to go back and look at that again this week and think about it, review it, look at the, the, the YouTube videos. And when we get here next week, I'll spend some time reviewing that a little bit and then we'll move on into the land beast. I'm not going to rush this because this is important to get right. Because when you get to market the beast and you start to come up with all kind of theory about um, vaccine and, and chip and thing, if you know all this properly, you'll realize that those things don't make sense. They don't align because we are lining up to something that is bigger than that. And we talk about the mark of the beast here in these chapters. Thank you all, everybody. Um, let's go ahead and pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. But more than that, we thank you for revealing the fact that you have a plan for us. And that even though things become shaky, that you are still in charge. As you have revealed to us today that there is a competing force against you and that there is a dragon who is cloning followers and believers and that worship systems will be developed that are not of God. Today we want to recommit ourselves to you. We want to say, God, you are the one, the only one who deserves worship. You are the creator of this universe. You are the one in charge. You are the one who died on Calvary to save us. And so whatever is in our lives that is unlike the worship you expect of us, move it away and grant us salvation. Not because of what we have done or what we plan to do, but because of your love for us in dying for us and Calvary. We thank you for being a God of love, but we thank you as well for having a plan that will draw us into everlasting life. Continue to be with us this week and bless us according to your name. is Jesus' most holy name. Amen. <laughs>